First and foremost, let me thank Ms. Hill for all of her support uh, through the course of development of uh, the presentation. want to welcome and thank each of you for being with us uh, this morning. As was mentioned, I'm Dr. Kelvin Holloway, the uh, Deputy Executive Director in the Department of Community Health. Uh, I have the privilege of uh, leading the Performance and Care Management Office uh, at uh, DCH. Uh, and over the medical assistance plan. And joining me this morning for the presentation is uh, Dr. Gloria Beecher. She is the Director of Population Health and Quality uh, Planning. Just over the next uh, few minutes, um, we'd just like to share with you uh, an overview of our quality approach within DCH. Uh, I'll provide some aspirational goals that we have in place as we strive to fulfill our mission at the department and within uh, the plan. Uh, we'll do that by providing just a brief overview with our roles and responsibility within our unit, uh, just touching briefly, providing some context uh, for how we try to drive uh, toward achieving our, our goals uh, with our performance improvement endeavors that Dr. Beecher will provide some insight into and how that fits within our overall quality strategy. So. Just to give you a little insight in regards to our unit itself, we have a responsibility as it relates to providing a framework that we operate within as we drive toward uh, improving optimal outcomes for our, our members and beneficiaries. Uh, how does that quality strategy uh, fit within that framework? How do we actually then identify improvement opportunities and coordinate and facilitate those activities with our care management organizations and other providers. And when we identify those uh, opportunities and PI opportunities, how do we track and monitor them uh, through the course of their uh, development? This is just a illustration of how we envision uh, uh, the journey. And, and you, you never arrive for those of us that are in quality and improvement. Uh, but we understand that, that we are not where we desire to be uh, as a, a state as it relates to our outcomes and, and value really for our, our members. Uh, but how do you build that capacity, um, capabilities, and drive to improve on that from where we are? Uh, we certainly have to build the capacity with our staff and our team uh, developing um, experts and SMEs or subject matter experts within our team, and we certainly uh, are doing that and have done that. Uh, Dr. Beecher is certainly evidence of uh, some of that activity in her team, but also in terms of the actual technology that we utilize, be it in terms of identifying the populations that we provide care for, that the data analytic pieces of that. How do we actually visualize our progress and how do we share that with stakeholders, both internal and external, and also in terms of the tools that we utilize to facilitate our improvement activities but also how do we address our processes, be it in simplification, be it for our providers or our members? How do we also, in terms of revamp reporting that we are in collaboration receive from our CMOs so they are meaningful for the CMOs as well as us? These are all parts of our activities of progressing toward a top tier <coughs> public payer that we all want to be for our beneficiaries and members but also building that capacity, what we've referenced. What we're gonna focus a little bit more on this morning is actually in terms of, just briefly, as I mentioned, taking a look at that quality strategy, the goals, the aims, the goals, and the measures that are used to drive toward those objectives, and touching just briefly as it pertains on how do we indeed ensure accountability? How do we become more transparent to members, providers, and all stakeholders? And we'll just provide some examples of how we uh, address that within the unit and DCH. So just briefly in terms of the quality strategy, it, and you'll see that site that you can go to, but it's actually on the DCH website where you can see the quality strategy uh, that's been in place and that actually guides our directions that we undertake right now. We, from a visual perspective and a construct, we develop our quality strategy around four pillars, uh, those pillars being quality, uh, service of the experience of our um, beneficiaries, uh, access and stewardship. How do we utilize 
limited resources, but how do we utilize them well? Our strategies are built around that pillar construct. And what we've done is identify three major aims within the quality strategy. You see them here in terms of improving health and services and the experience for our beneficiaries. How do we utilize our resources as limited as they might be, but how do we spend smarter? And also in terms of taking a look at our home community-based service population as well. So in addition to those members that are provided care through managed care organizations, but also in terms of those that are within the community, home and community-based service, mostly fee-for-service. How do we address those as well? That's all encompassed uh, within the quality strategy, encompassed here on these three aims and the actual nine goals that you see here. Six of these goals are noted here, and we've tried to identify those goals as it relates to that construct that we share with you as we told you the pillars, be it access, quality, service, and stewardship. That's what you see here. Uh, undergirding all of these are objectives as well as performance measures. And Dr. Beecher touched on those measures just a little bit to give you some insight of how they fit within this construct. We talked about in terms of accountability, well certainly from the standpoint of providing uh, information to not just internal, be it to DCH, but also to the public as well, or legislative bodies. So we've developed dashboards uh, for our populations, and they are ever evolving to be more. Uh, right now we have it for our Georgia family population as well as 360, um, and moving into more populations for you can be able to see how we stack up, be it from the managed care organizations, and Dr. Beecher touch base on that. But other accountability venues in terms of our gathering together within various bodies, the Quality Oversight Committee meets on a monthly basis where we have conversations with our CMOs, we look at data, we see how we're progressing on improvement endeavors, and it's that shared learning that also results in accountability. And there are other venues that are noted here the Georgia Family 360 has a committee that also is engaged in that, that's being relaunched. Our pharmacy services, be it the drug utilization review, and, and you see others that are here. The advisory committee for the medical care um, committee is mandated, be it through managed care and CMS, but it's also an opportunity to receive feedback from providers in the community for opportunities for improvement. So these venues and the tools that we reference serve as an accountability measure for our parties. I'm going to stop here and turn it over to Dr. Beecher, and she's going to walk you through the, the measuring and monitoring of the uh, various goals that we spoke of and uh, take us to our question and answer period as well. Thank you, Dr. Holloway. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for being here. As Dr. Holloway shared, this next set of slides will focus on the measures that we use to evaluate how we're doing against the goals that we have established. Of the bat, our performance metrics are drawn from NCQA, HEDIS, and uh, CMS Child and Adult Core Sets, as well as we do have some, a few internal customized measures that we have put into place. We have a dedicated team of PI specialists who map the performance as reports are sent into, into DCH, whether it's monthly, quarterly, or on an annual basis. We do have performance improvement projects in place. Some are mandated by CMS, and we do map the progress against those, and we, we leverage those PIPs in helping us to realize our goals. Presented here is a, is a list of some of the, the measures that we have selected. There are a number of, of measures, but based on our goals and our strategic plan or vision, we selected, some, these are some of the measures we selected. I can go through just a few of them. The, they're based on our four pillars. So the prenatal and postpartum care is based on our access. This is a measure that has two components. There's prenatal, that measure assesses how successful we are in getting our moms in for a visit 
within 42 days of being notified that they're pregnant. The postpartum care piece of it, and this is very important to us, especially as a state, because we all know the data and what it shows, the dire need for us to improve our performance with maternal care, especially in the postpartum period. And so this postpartum part of this measure assesses how the rate of our moms who have delivered, how many of them get in to have a postpartum, a post-delivery visit within seven to 84 days of their delivery based on best practice guidelines and the measures. That is, that is something that we aim to do and that we know we must improve on. Later on, I'll show you how we are doing on that measure. Uh, one of the quality measures, I'm gonna jump down to quality, and we look at comprehensive diabetes care. Again, comprehensive diabetes care, this is one of our chronic conditions that we monitor. And not just here in, in Georgia, but if you, you look at, at data across the nation, it seems like we're losing the fight on diabetes. Performance is always subpar. So it, it's, it never goes away because we always see the need to, to do better. And so we look at how well are we managing our parents or members who have diabetes? Are they having good control, which is considered any hemoglobin A1C that's less than 8% is considered good. There's also another component. If it's above 9, then it's considered poor. And, and so we seek to, to lower that, the score if it's above 9. Uh, a service is based on our member survey, I'm going all the way, the third from the bottom. So we, members are given the opportunity by way of a survey to rate their health plans, to see how they get in the care, the needed care when, 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 when they need care. Are specialists involved in their care if it's indicated? And annually, the survey is run and the data is fed to us and that we use to in the process to, to um, evaluate how well we're doing. What you're looking at now is a sample of our performance data that was based on measure year 2020. Our data comes to us with one year lag time. And these are validated data. They go, to, uh, um, they go through a validation process and so we accept these data as the source of truth as, as far as, as um, reliability is concerned. The key at the bottom shows that if there are five stars, it's, we're in the 90th percentile. So these are based on national benchmarks. Four stars is 75th to the 89th percentile. Three stars, 50th to the 74th. Two stars, 25th to the 49th. And anything below the 25th percentile is a one star. If we look at our prenatal and postpartum care measure, our timeliness of prenatal care, the very far right um, column is the one that gives us the, the overall state rating, and we are at a three, which means that we are doing better than those who fall below the 50th to 74th percentile. So we are in that percentile, 50th to 74th. Is that where we want to be? No, and so there's, there's still work to do. So we will carry that, that measure forward and continue to work at it. Our postpartum care, if we look to the very right again, we see we're just a two star, which means that we're in the 25th to the 49th percentile. And um, again, that's not quite where we, we would want to see ourselves. And so most definitely, that's an indication that we need to continue working on this measure some more performance outcomes data. These show our sampling of our chronic conditions, comprehensive diabetes care. We see good, good control, which is less than 8% for the hemoglobin A1C, but we are two star right across, the same with our, and for this measure, higher is better. The more people we have with their hemoglobin A1C less than eight, that's, that's what we want to see. So the numbers should be higher. On the flip side, poor control, those whose hemoglobin A1C is above 9%, we want to see very, very small numbers. But here we see that we have higher numbers, which means there's work to be done. 
The next set of slides we'll, we'll share with you. Once we look at the data and we see how we're, we're doing, and we identify those areas where more work is doing, then we set out to, to create interventions or strategies for improvement. And so on the access pillar where maternal health falls, we designed this year that we were going to expand access to increase pre and post partum visits. And the good news to share is that we, just a few days ago, we got the final checkoff where we, we are now extending postpartum care from six months to 12 months. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> and I believe we are leading, the state is leading the way. I think there was one other state that has gone this so quickly to extend into 12 months. So thanks to the leadership that made that happen, our members are set to benefit from that. We also have begun focused effort to schedule moms for timely postpartum care. We're using performance improvement projects to identify and remove barriers, um, social determinants of health bar barriers to care. We're also ensuring that mothers who are at high risk with their pregnancies, that they're given case management. Uh, we have dedicated resources and processes to ensure that we are making the effort to contact moms within one to two weeks of notification of pregnancy. And of course, we have, we have endorsed and are pushing the use of um, telehealth to help to address some of these access barriers, especially in the rural spaces where providers might not be very available. And so we are seeing maybe not a, a, a very large movement, but there is some movement in the direction of increased utilization of telehealth. Then we also are focusing on ensuring that there's access to primary specialty and behavioral health care. And again, we are using surveys to help us to, to to target areas, so we are trying to increase the percentage of members who are getting the needed care, and this is measured through the survey, because that's one of the, the items on the survey. Uh, I'm sorry, there's a message on my, my stuff here. It's technology, I'm sorry. It's giving me a message that my thing is gonna restart in five minutes. <laughs> and if it goes that, I think I have my own laptop here. Yeah, but it's only saying to either restart in five minutes or now. <laughs> To it? No. The update is required by your organization. <laughs> now. <laughs> it may ask again. You want to keep going? <laughs> you've got 23. Got uh, you've got. Just a few slides left. You wanna? Yeah, you can go. Okay, yeah. Why don't you, you proceed? Yeah. Yes, okay. Let, let, let's see what happens. Okay, <laughs> which means I'm gonna have to speed through this because I don't know what's gonna happen in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So some of the, the interventions we have for maternal health are fed over into access for the other um, levels of care. So I'm gonna speed through that, and I'm gonna come to the quality pillar for chronic conditions. Our objective is to improve care for chronic conditions. We want to, we are working to ensure that the CMOs are providing high performing care coordination programs, that they are utilizing the latest evidence base by way of we, we se select 
and disseminate to CMOs recommend to them clinical practice guidelines that reflect latest practices in, in the care of, of the, our members. We're also focusing on attention and response to social determinants of health issues to ensure that whatever barriers there are are identified and addressed so that the quality of care can be improved. We're doing aggressive outreach efforts to members for them to follow up with their care. Maternal and newborn. Our objective here is to reduce the rate of maternal mortality and newborn morbidity. Transitions to the CMS approved postpartum extensions going on. We have a PIP that's designed to improve and track case management for high risk pregnancies. I mentioned that before as well as efforts to improve access to family planning and interpregnancy care services by increasing awareness and enrollment in the P4HB program. Our stewardship, right level of care, we want to ensure that our members are utilizing the appropriate level of care to match the condition that they're, they're, they're having so that we do not see overutilization of the ER for things that can be managed in a non urgent setting. Um, it's been reported very often that very often our members go to the ER. They, they, they do not see a primary care provider. And so we have to reach them. Um, maybe develop systems of access for aftercare hours. A more robust nurse advice program, nurse advice land program. And of course, extensive education to help members to improve their self-management skills and knowledge of their disease. Again, designing aggressive outreach efforts to at-risk members to offer case management at appropriate level as indicated. Oh, it took me through. <laughs> now, all of this information we have shared here this morning, you can find in depth information on our website. We post an annual report of the previous year, as I've shared, there's a one year lag. There's a technical report that comes out every year that reflects data from the previous year. It's available, it gives you all the details you, you need to, to, to know about what we're doing in terms of quality. There's a dashboard for quick visualization. And of course, the in-depth quality strategy plan, all those may be found at this link here that we are showing, Georgia's Medicaid quality dash reporting. And I think it's a dot, dot, dot org. And then we get to the question mark. Is there something? <laughs> Thanks for your patience. And if you have any questions, we are here to respond, both Dr. Holloway and I. Any questions? Anyone? Yes. Yes, and I'm going to call on Dr. Holloway, and I see Lynette here, if I could ask them to respond to that. Um, what does the 12-month extension mean for moms? Off the bat, it means that they have access for a longer period of time. Even prior to the six months, after 60 days, they'll be gone. Then we extended it to six months. And oh, thank you, Lynette. Sorry, so I, I can um, respond to the discussion. So Is there a mic?
Und? Thank you, Lynette. And the only thing that I add when we think about it from the standpoint of that additional time period for the, uh, the, the ladies to have their uh, connecting with a provider uh, to impact the uh, horrendous mortality rate that we see, that the bulk of those deaths occur within that six month period and then there's still a, a tail that takes place in those remaining six months. So we have an opportunity now by connecting these ladies with a provider, which so many of them have chronic conditions coming into the pregnancy, and they come in not having a provider. So now the opportunity to connect the ladies from a primary care perspective, but also as we move close to that 12-month period, hopefully those that or will not be eligible to, uh, to remain within Medicaid we can work through a transition plan for them as well to connect them for care, be it possibly plan for healthy babies. So there are other opportunities when we think about the 12 month period to impact the mortality and morbidity. Absolutely, it also helps us to, to deliver care. Come to the mic. It helps us to, to deliver care to the moms, to be consistent with the recommendations from ACAB they recommend that within the first seven days at least mom should ha have a contact with a clinical person, but not only that, there ought to be at least one comprehensive visit within that 12 month period. Comprehensive meaning not just a physical, but you're assessing mental, behavioral needs, social needs. And so this extension makes that possible for our, our moms to get that, the best practice care. Thanks for that question. Do we have another question? Any, anyone else? Well, why don't you segue into what we're taking, taking a look at as far as other provider types. This morning, Lynette made mention of the resource mother. Uh, so the, the ladies during this 12-month period will have access to resource mothers to connect them with uh, resources in the community that may address barriers to care. Uh, that's something that would be new within this period as well. But something that the department is looking at as well is in terms of is there opportunity for other health care workers, mm -hmm. uh, be it community health care workers, doulas, what, what's the benefit there? Uh, so those are things that we're looking at too. A medical home, just as there's primary care medical home in, in the industry, there's a medical home for uh, pregnancy care as well. So those are all things that are in the mix that we're looking at as far as how can we continue to address um, the outcomes for our, our mothers. We're also, um, prior to the pandemic, there was the Center in Pregnancy pilot that was running. And that, just yesterday, the hospitals are now getting back to a place where they can begin to, to look at Center in Pregnancy programs. And so that's gonna come on, that's gonna be very helpful for our moms. One of the, the, the best in, um, strategies that we have seen is that postpartum visits are made during a delivery so that mom walks out of the delivery room with an appointment for a follow-up visit. And that's very, very important. And another thing, we, we're, we're looking at a, a number of, of innov innovations or best practice that's already in industry. We're measuring the fact that a number of our moms um, die from preeclampsia or cardio-related conditions. Uh, we're looking at self-monitoring of high blood pressure and if there's any value in setting up self-monitoring blood pressure plans for moms, suit them out with a, a blood pressure monitoring device and getting them on that postpartum care to self-manage and call in with blood pressure readings so as to kind of alert providers if something is going downhill post-discharge. So there are a number of things we're we, we are looking at, and as Dr. Holloway shared, we are assessing the value of, we already have the resource moms, and the resource moms will come in the postpartum 12-month extension period. So th that, that will be an extra bonus. But we are also looking at the value. Do we have both resource moms and doula? 
where does the doula start, where does the doula end, and the resource mom, or do they work side by side to provide support to the mom. The, uh, one other thing we're looking at, as Dr. Holloway shared, we, we kind of put the, the idea out there, is visiting providers in our rural spaces. We're, we are now pulling research to see if such a program exists. Um, I attended a presentation once, and visiting providers is, is something that they do in Alaska. You know, Alaska has lots of rural spaces and hard to get to spaces. And so they have a, a provider team that goes into communities may, with some frequency, maybe once or twice a week, uh, a month, to see moms and to provide care because the moms can't get to them. So mom can't come to you, you go to mom. And that's an option. Um, it's kind of sister to um, a mobile clinic, except this is focused, is focused specifically on delivering care to mom in the pre and post phases of, of, of um, delivery. Yes, there's a hand at the back. Yes, ma'am. You have a question online, and the question is, is the 12-month extension already in effect? If a mom gave birth in December of 2021, then is she still eligible for services until December 2022? Also, do they have to reapply if they have already been told that their insurance expires in June? Thank you. So, a couple of parts. Um, let's see. The the this is how I will I will tackle this. So, the twelve month uh, postpartum extension was approved by CMS last week. It's effective as of November one. Okay, which is just just yesterday. So, if you are already uh, an enrolled mom um, and you have delivered, you are today, right now, under the 1115 waiver, which extended postpartum services to six months. So we're going to have to do a transition, and I, and I mentioned that in the opening session. So if you're already enrolled, you've been enrolled, and I think the example was December of 2021. Um, so you're, you're already, you're on, number one, because we've not terminated you because of the public health emergency. Um, so you've remained on and will remain on um, because of the public health emergency, but you're probably under the 1115 waiver, um, which extended postpartum services to six months, and that's fine. Um, it, it, it's really a moot point because of the public health emergency. So you're still getting all of the services under the Medicaid benefit really because of the PHE. The plan um, that we have proposed to CMS is before we phase out the 1115 waiver that extends to six months, we're going to do a redetermination of all of those moms who are in the 1115 waiver. So we're going to look at them. How long have you been um, under the 1115 waiver? When did the pregnancy end? And then we're gonna come up with a transition plan for those moms. Um, so it won't be a situation where, you know, we just go and, you know, terminate everyone who's under the 1115. There's a, a well-vetted transition plan that we're gonna have in place to transition those moms over uh, to the 12 months. So the if you're new coming in the door right now you know brand spanking new coming in the door and you're pregnant you're going to go under the 12 month postpartum does that does that make sense so if you're already in you're already on you've already delivered you're, you're on because of the phe we're not going to terminate you because the phe is in place but you're probably under the 1115 which extended to six months we're going to have to transition those women over to the 12 month versus if you're brand spanking new and you're coming in the door, then you're going under the bucket of the 12 month postpartum. I hope that answers um, the question for the person online. Okay. 
you know, m most of our conversations take place in collaborations with the CMOs. So there certainly would be a responsibility for DCH to interact, but also the CMOs will be communicating uh, with the uh, beneficiaries of the mothers. Now she was asking, are there any additional questions? Absolutely. Good morning. I saw on the slide that there is a, a strategy to incentivize more providers to accept Medicaid. So I wanted to see if you guys could expand on what that strategy is and and see if that can close some of our, you know, access issues in more some of the more rural counties of the state. So one thing we always think about from the standpoint of be it in terms of be it through our CMOs who have incentive plans. Uh, that's one way we think about that. Also in terms of when there's an opportunity to add additional benefits that may speak to certain providers, those are certainly things that we're engaged on an ongoing basis. Uh, anything else comes to mind? Those are the major undertakings. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? Yes, sir. You have great data statewide for the CMOs. Are you aware of any dashboards that we can use to see how well we're doing in achieving those, uh, those outcomes? We, our practice used to participate in the, uh, the Medicaid promoting interoperability, I think was the latest name for it. And we use Athena Health. We, they had a great dashboard. As Soon as the program ended last year, they said, Oh, that program's over. Nobody needs to know how well they're doing, which mm. to me seems stupid. You've already built the darn thing. So and any suggestions on how we can improve that so we can see how our practices are doing uh, in contributing. And we, we do a lot of uh, fee-for-service patients and uninsured patients who are not going to show up in the CMO part of it. Sure. And, and you, uh, you very, very good question. Uh, a couple of things, and, and we're going to speak to the, the, the gap in the future state. Uh, as it stands right now, we certainly are very much in partnership with uh, the, the care management organizations and the, uh, not only their incentive plans, but the feedback loop that they provide to their physicians and their panels uh, in terms of their performance on various measures. Uh, and you're right. Uh, that's certainly for those uh, members that are uh, covered on the CMO, CMOs, which we know is about 70%. As it stands right now, we don't have the best uh, mechanism in place for that population that's under the fee-for-service. We are developing some tools on the home community-based services side to develop a dashboard for that population, but age blind and disabled not within the home community-based service, right now there's a gap. There's a gap in terms of aggregate information that we can share with providers as pertains to those populations. So there's an opportunity certainly for us to uh, develop something there uh, but more to come did that address you it did yeah i think one of the things that that pays quality in general and we see reflected here is data availability you know where do you go to find the data because in the absence of data you can't tell a story you can't create a visualization and so that's one of the things that we are currently working on trying to dig to find the source of truth where those data lie, how to access them, and pull them into dashboards. Yeah. And just one tangential point, uh, again, where gaps are, and, and we need to do a better job uh, in terms of communicating uh, with the persons we serve, our beneficiaries, our members, uh, from the standpoint of the importance of the demographic information. It's not just about uh, in their business, <laughs> but it helps us understand who they are and who we serve and where there's opportunity and gaps. So there's a reason that we need to know some sense of uh, race and sex and so forth so that we can have an appreciation where there are disparities and whether or not there needs to be specific attention and programs, be it through our uh, plans, to address that. And with, without that data being there, it's kind of hard to address 
social determinants of health for a segmented population if you don't know what that is. So we still have a ways to go, but I think there's a lot that we can do to better communicate how we utilize that data. Uh, so I just kind of use this forum to speak to one of my pet peeves that we need to work on. Yeah. We doing okay, time-wise? We're okay. Any, any other questions? Yes, sir. clinic serves anybody who walks in the door. We see, we see a lot of CMO patients. We are not yet contracted with any of the CMOs. I assume your data is based on claims. Is that? It is. Right? So when we're seeing moms and babies, you don't know that. <laughs> we're, we're trying to resolve that on our end. So, so the, the real numbers, as you said, the data is the data. The real numbers, the percentages may be a little bit higher than what your claims data is showing. I don't know if there, if there are other clinics around the state that are seeing patients but not able to bill for them. You know, you, you bring up a very good point. I mean, historically, um, within our healthcare industry, uh, claims data was never intended to be used for quality. That, that most people don't have that recognition, but we do. The disclaimer is in terms of that assumes that you get good claims data be it from your providers. And we have conversation all the time with our, our CMO our colleagues that you, you have to ask the question, is this real or is it lacking information coming in about this encounter? So am I dealing with a true quality issue, and I put true in quotes, or is it a data flow issue? It is what it is as far as what you get, but you have to sort through which one you need to address to truly reflect what the, the issue is, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you so much for your time and thanks again for being here.